Has this ever happened to you? Maybe you had some money. Maybe somebody gave you some money or you made some money and you took that money and you put it right in your pocket. And then a little bit later, you went to get that money out only to realize you had a hole in your pocket. You ever lost any money like that? Boy, that's a, a tough feeling when you go around looking and who knows where all you've been and where it might be. There's a message there. And it's the message that we find in the book of Haggai when God's people aren't putting him first. It's like putting money in a bag with a hole in it. Nahum or Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 18, the same book or the same message, God says, neither their silver nor their gold we'll be able to save them. There were times of worldliness. There were times of prosperity in Israel. And yet during those times, the people started trusting in their wealth and not in God. And it created great problems for them. Isn't that a practical message for us today? Sometimes our prosperity and our wealth gets in the way of us putting God where he ought to be. And so today we're studying the books of Zephaniah and Haggai with this powerful message in sight. We hope you'll join us for this study together. To destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The Gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the Gospel of Christ. We're so glad that you've joined us for our study today. As always, we want you to know that today's lesson is being brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your local area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. Whether that be on Sunday for worship or Wednesday for Bible study, you would be an honored guest at any of their assemblies. You'll find people there who love God, who love others, and who are deeply concerned about the souls of men and women. Friend, if you've got a Bible question, maybe you're wondering about salvation or the church or, or any number of religious uh, matters, you'll find people in the Lord's church in your local area who'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God with you in kindness and love and look at the truth of God's Word. Also, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your desire to know God better. We encourage you to check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all our lessons. They're available to you free of charge. In fact, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons, just go to our website, fill out a media request form. We'd be happy to make that available to you as a digital download or other formats if you need that as well. And friend, we want to encourage you also to check us out on Facebook, like our Facebook page, follow us on that. Great way to keep up with things that we're doing. And then, of course, in our fast-paced world today, where everybody's got a smartphone, we want to encourage you to check out the Gospel of Christ app that's available in the respective Play Stores. You can get it there, and it's a great way to keep up with our new lessons, what we're doing, and just so that you can know how we're trying to spread the Gospel and reach people with the news of Jesus Christ. And as always... We want to thank you today for joining us for our study. Hope you've got your Bible ready. Let's look to the Word of God together. Zephaniah is not one of the more well-known minor prophets. In fact, he's probably one of the less known, but he has a powerful message to God's people about getting God right, making sure that they're in the right relationship with Almighty God. Let me give you just a few key phrases and key ideas in the book of Zephaniah. Key verse, Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 3, Seek the Lord. All you meek of the earth who've upheld justice, seek righteousness, seek humility. It may, may be that you'll be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. And so Zephaniah is all about seeking what you ought to seek. Seek God, seek righteousness, seek humility, seek the things that are good. And the people of God had not been doing that. 
They'd been seeking after wealth and worldliness and prosperity. And so the book of Zephaniah shows God's divine anger and his jealousy for his people to be faithful to him. There's some key words, and the two key words are contrasting ideas. You have both love and anger. God loves his people. He wants them to be saved, but God's angry when they choose not to follow him and let worldliness and prosperity get in the way. Now, there's a key phrase in the book of Zephaniah that occurs seven times, and it is the phrase, day of the Lord. There's a day coming. When your silver and gold's not going to save you, there's a day coming when you're, if you're not seeking God and righteousness, you're going to be held accountable for that. And so Zephaniah encourages the people in view of that day of the Lord, that day of impending judgment, to put first things first and not let the worldliness and prosperity get in the way. And so what are some practical lessons that we can learn today from the book of Zephaniah as we said, wealth cannot save from the day of the Lord. Look at Zephaniah chapter 1, verse number 18. God says, Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured, the Bible says, by the fire of his jealousy, for he will make speedy riddance of all those who dwell in the land. During the times of King Josiah, when Israel had fallen away from God and was not doing what they wanted to, especially the wealthy and the elite here, God calls them out. And God, in essence, says, you think you've got all this money. You think you've got all this silver and gold. You think that you are wealthy and that wealth on the day of judgment, on the day of the Lord. What good's that wealth going to do you? If you had a, a, a pile of gold and you had blocks of silver stacked to the ceiling on the day of judgment, on the day of the Lord, if you weren't right with God and you had lived like you ought to, what good are you going to say, God, I know I've not lived right, but hey, look at all this gold and silver I've got. Don't you? I trade you. Not the way it works. The Bible clearly, clearly teaches the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Idolatry, putting things before God, worldliness is a form of idolatry. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. We're not redeemed with aimless things like silver and gold from our aimless conduct handed down by tradition from our fathers, Peter says, but with the precious blood of Christ. Silver and gold, wealth, prosperity, I can't save you in the final. You know what it does? Silver and gold and wealth and prosperity kind of makes you numb. It, 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 it kind of drowns out the things sometimes that are really important. If we got enough, if we've got a big home and a three-car garage and we don't have any problems, or we just think, hey, everything's okay, I'm okay. When in reality, we're just kind of being slowly tortured into not serving God and not putting him where he ought to be. What else do we learn from the book of Zephaniah? The Bible teaches that God's going to intervene and take care of his people who are faithful. Look at Zephaniah chapter 2, verse number 7. The Bible says, talking about the remnant who are faithful, the coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. That's where from the Messiah came as well. They shall feed their flocks there in the houses of Ashkelon. They shall lie down in evening. Listen now, for the Lord their God will intervene for them and return their captives. Bring God always takes care of his people. Romans 8, 31, shall sword or peril or who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Nobody. 1 Peter 5, verse 7 tells us we can cast all our cares upon him. He cares for us. Jesus is able to give help to those who are in need. Hebrews 2, verses 17 and 18. And the Bible teaches in Psalm 46, 1, our God is our strength and refuge in time of trouble. Does this mean 
Christians will never suffer. D did this mean that nobody who was righteous died in the Babylonian or the Assyrian captivity? Does this mean that in the book of Revelation, no Christians who are faithful ever died? No, that's, that's not the idea. What it means is they were okay with God regardless. They were taken care of. Their eternal state was all right. And friend, that's the idea. God's going to intervene for his people. He's going to make sure that when calamity comes, if we're living like we ought to, our names are written on heaven's registrar. We'll hear the great statement, well done, good and faithful servant. My friend, I also want you to see this one. Look at the wickedness of man mentioned in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 7. Look at how corrupt these people were. I said, God said, surely you will fear me. Surely you'll receive instruction so that her dwelling would not be cut off despite everything for which I punished her. Now watch this. But they rose early and corrupted all their deeds. God said, surely they'll wake up. Surely they're going to realize everything I've done, that I'm trying to call them back to me, that I'm trying to help them get their life right. Surely they'll get it. And yet they got up early. They set their alarm and woke up early to make themselves even more corrupt. Isn't that a sad picture of the wickedness of Israel, of the wickedness of God's people during that time, making a plan to get up early and to corrupt themselves? And yet how many people have that mindset? They're bent on doing evil. Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter five, they are smart. For do, do, doing evil, they don't know how to do good, but they're really good at doing evil. They've worked that out in their mind. And so we need to make sure that we don't fall into a trap where evil is what we seek after. Evil is what we're pursuing. Evil is what we're getting up every day to do. Friend, that's not the kind of life that God wants a person to live. From the book of Zephaniah, we also learn kind of on a positive end to the book that there is joy in God's faithfulness and those who trust in God can find that joy. Look in Zephaniah chapter 3. And I want you to notice what the Bible says in verses 14 and 15. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Why? The Lord has taken away your judgments. He's cast out your enemy. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. And so when the people of God got the message, when they returned back to God, God was faithful in doing what he said. And the Lord's always been faithful to his people. Second Peter 3 verse 9 says, The Lord's not slow concerning his promises, as some men count slowness, but he's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish. God doesn't want anybody to go to hell, but that all should come to repentance. If God gives us, if God makes the promise, gives us a way, encourages us and teaches us to repent and turn to him and all our sins can be forgiven, friend, the person who does that can trust and rejoice in the faithfulness of God, just like the people then could. Now let's think about kind of a companion book, the book of Haggai. The people in the book of Haggai are also dealing with great prosperity. And so here's the history of that. 70 years after they had been in, Israel had been in 70 years of Babylonian captivity, as was promised by God in Jeremiah 25, verses 8 through 12. Just as God promised that there would be a captivity, there was also a release from that captivity promised in Jeremiah 29, verses 10 through 12. After that captivity was over, God allowed Cyrus to allow God's people to go home in the year 536, last verse of Isaiah 44, first verse of Isaiah 45, verse 1. And so these exiles, out of captivity, they're commissioned to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, the temple. Uh, they lay the foundation in Ezra 3 and 4. And yet, right in the midst of this, the work on the temple kind of comes to a halt. There are about 16 to 17 years that pass and no work is being done on the house of God. What have the people been doing? 
the people kind of got busy on their own projects and they were giving themselves to other projects, uh, building their own houses, their wealth and prosperity has kind of got in the way. And so it's at this point, this, this lull in Israel where prosperity took over and they forgot about God, that the prophet Haggai arises telling them to continue the temple. Haggai preaches his message, and according to Ezra 5, 1 and 2, it is this message that helps them to build the temple. The people prospered throughout the preaching of Haggai. The temple is ultimately completed, and yet Haggai kind of had to get on to him pretty harsh that your blessings are about to leave. You're about to lose it all if you continue in this law and don't put God first. And so what's the message of Haggai all about? Some of the words that you'll hear, some of the key words are consider. Haggai will say over and over again, consider your ways. Think about what you're doing. Here you've stopped working on the house of God. You're up on the hilltop building your summer houses. Evidently, they've got more than one. And God's temple lies in ruins. Won't you stop and think about really what's important? Consider what you ought to be working on instead of just your summer houses. And so the message of Haggai is all about putting God first, putting things where they need to be. Key verse which we want to mention is Haggai chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Look at this verse with me. Notice what Haggai says in chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your way. You've sown much and bring in little. You eat, but do not have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one's warm. He who earns wages, earns wages to put it in a bag with hope. Think about everything Haggai's... You, you're eating, but you're not getting full. You're eating, but you're still hungry. You, you take a drink, and you're still thirsty. You put clothes on, and you're still cold. You put money in a bag, and it all falls out the bottom. What's the point? You're doing all these things, but you're not taking care of the right thing first. If you take care of God first, God's going to take care of everything else. And so throughout the book of Haggai, Haggai begins by addressing some excuses the people had for not considering their ways and putting God first. What were some of their excuses? It's just not time. The time is not right to do that now. Look at Haggai chapter 1 verse 2. Notice what they say. Haggai 1 verse 2, thus speaks the Lord of hosts saying, this people says, here's their excuse. The time's not come. The time that the Lord's house should be built. Well, what in essence did they say? Not right now. Maybe a little later. We don't have time for that. Now's not the right time to do that. Friend, do we ever use that excuse? Do we ever say, I just don't have time to do that for the Lord. I don't have, I didn't have enough time to be involved in this project. Here, here's the problem. We've all got the same amount of time. Psalm 90 verses 1 and 2, at best, we're going to have 70, 80 years on this earth. It's like a vapor. James 4 verse 14, every individual person has the same amount of time. The real problem was not a matter of time. They just weren't ready. They, they were too busy doing other things and not putting God first. They procrastinated. Matthew 25, the story of the 10 virgins. Five virgins got ready. They trimmed their lamp, had oil in it. When the bridegroom came, they could go with him, and there was great rejoicing. The other five, uh-oh, we forgot about our oil. We better go in the city and buy some. While they're gone, the master comes and the door shut. Procrastination, my friends, is a serious problem. We think, not right now, tomorrow. I'll do that. I'll put God first when I get everything else ready. That's not the way it works. Now's the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6 verses 1 through 3 teaches us. What's another excuse that they used? Well, fear 
also kept the people in the book of Haggai from considering their ways. Look in Haggai chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. God says, Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work. For I am with you, says the Lord of hosts, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. And so what's going on is you've got the people of the land in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah are, are threatening them, are, are trying to keep them from doing the work. And, and God's people who just came out of captivity kind of got afraid. We don't want to go back into that. We better not be too busy about this. So fear kept them from putting God first. Fear of the enemy and sometimes fear of God. Do we ever let fear, we ever say to ourselves, if I do that, I might mess up or I'm afraid I won't do it right or what if I do wrong or maybe we're afraid of, of what other people will think or maybe we're afraid of how God will look at it. Friend, God has never, ever been angry at somebody who tried and maybe wasn't 100% on it. What makes God angry is when we let fear keep us from beginning in the first place. They were afraid of the enemies. They weren't going to get busy working on the temple of God. And so Haggai goes and preaches a message to them. Friend, don't let fear keep us from doing what we ought to do. And then there's a third thing, and that's worldliness. Worldliness kept the people from putting God first. Look at Haggai chapter 1. What other excuse did they make? Haggai chapter 1 verse 4. God says, is it time? for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Here the people are saying, we don't have time. And God says, you don't have time. What do you mean you don't have time? Here you've got these beautifully ornate paneled houses that you're building and you don't have time to build the house of God. Again, it wasn't a matter of time. It was a matter of worldliness. They got so caught up in the prosperity and the pleasure and the worldliness that it kind of lulled them to sleep on the things they really needed to be seeking. I wonder if that ever happens to us. Prosperity, worldliness, seeking after a good living, trying to make that mortgage payment, trying to have everything everybody else has and keep up with the Joneses. Does that ever keep us from really putting first things first? I'm not saying that you can't have things, you can't have homes, you can't have cars. That's, that's not the idea. But does it keep us from putting first things first? James 4 verse 4 says it absolutely does. Some in James's day had that problem, and God said, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore desires to make himself a friend of the world, world comes first, has become an enemy of God. Friend, we can't let worldliness get in the way of us serving God and really putting him first in our life. And so what is it that, that Haggai wants us to do? Haggai wants us to consider our ways. Haggai over and over again says, will you just stop and think about it? Will you consider what you're doing? Friend, as a child of God, it's good for me to stop and think about my priorities. Consider your ways for just a moment. Consider what's really important? Are we really putting God and his kingdom above everything else? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, Matthew 6, 33. Are we doing, are we making it priority number one to make sure we get to heaven? What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Is your soul your number one priority? Are we intent on doing things to God's glory? Isaiah 43, verse 7, Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14. Have we denied ourselves, and are we taking up our cross every day? Galatians 2, verse 20. Think about how Haggai causes us to really stop and think about what are my priorities? What am I putting my effort what am I putting my energy? What am I putting my time and my talent and my intellect toward? Is it really being focused 
on the right things? Are we given to the Lord as we ought to give? Look at what Haggai says again in Haggai 1, verses 4 through 6. This is such a graphic illustration. God says, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Think about it. You've sown much and you bring in little. You eat but do not have enough. You drink but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves but no one is warm. He warm. He earns wages, earns wages to put it in a bag with holes in it. Are we really giving attention to the right things? You got all these people involved in all these things and, and none of it's really prospering. Why not? Because you haven't put the first thing above everything else. Here's how it works. Here's how we often think. I got my job, and I've got my home, and I've got my family, and I've got recreation, and I've got all these things I'd like to do, and oh yeah, God's a part of that. No, God's got to be at the center. Everything flows out from God. If God's not priority number one, Friend, the prosperity and the blessings and the time and effort that we're putting into it, it's really being wasted. And we're not giving to God as we ought to give. And so what is it that motivates us to put God first and do the things that God wants us to do? Now, let me share with you just a couple of things toward the end of Haggai. Uh, the love and the care of God ought to motivate us. Look at Haggai chapter 2. I want you to see what's said in verses 15 through 19. Why put God first? And now, Haggai says, carefully consider from this day forward, from before stone was laid upon stone in the temple of the Lord, since those days when one came to a heap of 20 ephahs, there was but 10. When one came to the wine vat to draw up 50 from the press, there was but 20. I struck you with blight, mildew, hail, in labor of all your hands, yet you did not consider nor turn to me, says the Lord. Consider now from this day forward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it, is the seed still in the barn? As yet the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, the olive tree have not yielded fruit. But from this day, listen now, from this day, God says, I will bless you. The love, the care, the compassion of God is what ought to motivate us to seek him first. And so don't let your wealth, don't let your prosperity keep you from putting God first. We hope today that that will be an encouragement for every one of us. And join us next time as we study more from the Minor Prophets. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. The gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On demand, and downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.